Welcome to the Hunt Fish Travel Podcast, the first and longest running female hosted hunting podcast. When she's not gearing up for turkey season, she's helping you navigate your trip of a lifetime. And now, here's your host, Tess, Carrie Zilka. This episode is brought to you by Cryptic, K R Y P T E K. I am in love with their new camo. I wore the Highlander bib overalls and coat while I was hunting down in Illinois and up in Wisconsin. And I can't wait to wear it this year in the cold weather because it really kept me super warm and I love the Highlander pattern. It's also brought to you by Real Avid. Check out Real Avid for all of your gun needs. They have a wonderful shotgun tool as well as lots of AR accessories. So if you're into guns, check out realavid.com. All right, we are live. Hey, what's going on, Gary? Hey, Ron. Welcome to the Hunt Fish Travel Podcast. For the listeners, if you don't listen to the Hunting Dog Podcast, you are missing out. Today's guest, we have Ron Bame, who is the host of the Hunting Dog Podcast. And we're going to talk. We're just going to talk. It's going to be kind of off the cuff. I don't have a lot of questions written down because I'm not even sure what kind of questions to ask because we're thinking about buying a house. And eventually, I'd like to buy a hunting dog, and I have no idea where to even start. So, we've got Ron on the line to tell us all sorts of stuff about hunting dogs and considerations for buying a puppy. So, Ron, I'll welcome do, to the show. Thanks, Carrie. I'll, I'll do my best without trying to bust your bubble. But <laughs> okay. <laughs> I would say you can always fix a house later and make it the way you want it, but the dog, you're kind of stuck with. So, I would say... Do at least as much research on the dog as you're doing your house if you're going to get one one day. Really? Um, yeah. I mean, it, it's fun. I, mean, I started out, my first dog, I, I moved from Chicago, lived in the, in, right in the city limits of Chicago until I was in my 20s. And as soon as I got to Michigan, I said, oh, I got to start. You know, I used to hunt in, in Illinois, pheasant hunt and rabbit hunt, but no dog. And and I, I had to get a dog. And the first one I found in a newspaper for $40, first German short hair. And I got exactly that. I got $40 worth of German <laughs> short hair. Okay. So, so uh, although one of my guests a couple of years ago on the podcast actually got his dog from a Craigslist ad, and it did turn out okay. So I guess nowadays it might be, you know, better than a newspaper ad going online. But um, I, I think when people get in their first dog – you know, you really got to think about how much you really are going to hunt and be honest with yourself because, um, honestly, the Labrador is the most popular dog in this country. Anybody knows that. You know, if it was on a Jeopardy $500 question, you know, number one registered breed in America is the Labrador Retriever, and one one millionth of them ever put a duck in their mouth, okay? So, you know, you can buy a sporting dog. It doesn't have to go hunting. But then there are some sporting dogs out there that really, uh, really need to work and exercise more than other ones. So that would be like my first, my first piece of advice to anybody. Be real honest with yourself because, you know, everybody, just like when you get a new gun, you're going to go hunt a whole bunch and you buy a new yeah. camo and, oh, I'm going to use it every day. And guess what happens? Work gets in the way, life gets in the way, and everything else, you know. So Yeah, that's I, a good point. Yeah, and then, and, and if you're, and this is another thing I tell people, because I, I breed dogs as well, and not, not heavy duty, but a, a, about a litter a year maybe. And, uh, and I tell everybody, first thing you should do is build yourself some kind of an outside kennel run. I know you're going to buy a house somewhere, and you're going to like, oh, that might not look good, but put some kind of an outside run connected to the garage. It doesn't have to be big. You can put a little fence around it if you've got neighbors that don't like looking at it. Um, because there's a lot of times when, like, you want to go out or you've got to go check on somebody. It's who knows where. Work late. Husband's got to work late. You guys got to want to go away for the weekend. You just want someone to feed him for a night. It is so convenient. Um, yet that usually falls on a lot of deaf ears from the people who buy dogs from me. I don't know why, but it does. So that's the second thing you have to buy with your house. You have to get a kennel. So, yeah. But well, that, budget well, that, that is good to know because if you are considering a, legitimately considering purchasing a puppy, a dog, for any kind of a dog that you're going to need a kennel in the backyard, there are a lot of homeowners associations that wouldn't even allow that. So yeah, yeah, that's a big that's true. consideration. 
you don't want to buy a house. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, now I can't even get the dog I want because I can't put up a kennel in the backyard. That's (laughs) really, yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. I've, I've always lived out in the kind of the country in the last, Mm -hmm. you know, 30 years, but yeah, you're right. There, there's some neighborhoods that they're not even, they don't even let you put a, you know, picket fence up if, you know, they don't yep. they have it written that way. So, and, right. and you can get around that by putting a small run in your garage. You know, just, just, I'm always saying somewhere where that dog, you know, people I think make the biggest mistake, they get a puppy in there. And if they, you know, people say, when's the right time to get a puppy? There's no real right time. I have people that call me up and say, are you going to have any litters in the summer? Um, when the kids are going to be off school because that's when we want to start a dog. I'm like, I can't time that a year ahead of time with heat cycles and things like that. You know, there's just, <laughs> right. you know, I, I mean, nothing's, nothing's that guaranteed, you know. Um, so if you make the commitment and you get, you know, you have an inside kennel for it when, when it's in the house and you're not able to pay attention to it. When you can, you know, get that outside kennel built or at least some kind of a, a little kennel run on the wall of the garage on the inside. Yeah, you might, if you can't put a door out, and if your neighborhood won't let you, you know, I am sure, you know, if the dog poops in his little kennel run, that's not the end of the world. You know, I mean, yeah. we're not talking about leaving them out there a long time. But yeah. with that outside kennel run, I find the dogs, you know, they're less bored. If, if you just go to work and they're in your, in your crate training process with a young dog, you know, he's got to learn that crate's his place and his, his favorite place to be. And, his, you know, he loves sleeping there. And if, you know, if you're lucky, you can come home at lunch or somebody can, but if not, you know, the pup could be in there eight or nine hours for a time. Well, it'd be a lot better if he was able to just get some fresh air, go back into another little box, but then be able to go stretch his legs out and look at the birds in the yard and stuff like that. But uh, I know a lot of people don't do it, and, and I, I, think it's, I think it's really important. So that's the first step. So let me, okay, so let me ask you a couple questions on that. So, mm-hmm. like, I live in Wisconsin. It's freaking cold all of the time, mm-hmm. like fucking all the time. It's cold. It's not all the time. I, I was there. It was hot. I was, I was there oh, once and it was hot. It was like okay. for three days in August. Yeah, that's when it was, but, August. It was hot. But, no, all joking aside, we have a very, you know, the DNR stock pheasant, so we have a lot of people who enjoy the upland bird game hunting here. So if I'm thinking about getting a puppy, and I'm going to put do like the outside kennel. Are there certain breeds maybe that would be better suited for our colder climate? Because it's a lot different than having a dog in Alabama as it is having an out, inside outdoor dog in Wisconsin. But right. I, I, I would so say, I, yeah, there's, there's a few breeds that you may, you may want to – you're probably going to worry about it more than it's worth. Because, again, when I say an outside kennel run, I always have – and this would be where, like I always tell people, you know, I don't, I don't expect anybody to build a kennel building with inside-outside runs. You know, I'm just talking about like a, a small fence. You can buy it from Tractor Supply or Farm and Fleet, and it's got a gate on it. Maybe put a sunroof on it, you know, a little tarp over it. It doesn't have to be big. And then if you have a little, a little access door to the inside of the garage or a garden shed, a lot of people do it next to a garden shed, you could literally build or buy a small dog crate. Um, now, not the kind you put in the car. It'd be like more of a wooden or aluminum skin dog crate. And yeah. I had German short hairs for years. They do not have a lot of body fat on them. They don't have yeah. much of a coat. It's, it's a very short coat. And in the beginning, before I built my kennel, um, that is exactly how they lived through the winter. And, you know, Michigan's not a lot different than you guys. Um, no. You know, it depends on what part of, you know, Michigan we're talking about. But, um, you know, so and you, you put some straw in there, and I'm telling you what, a dog curl up in a box. Don't overbuild the box size, as a good friend of mine's uncle or father-in-law did for him. You could put three people and the dog in it. It does, it does not hold the heat. But you literally, that, that's another thing. I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to kind of jump around. When people think about getting a dog crate, um, they tend to get a crate that's bigger than the dog needs. You, the dog, you know, historically, you know, a wild, any wild canine, they're going to go into something they can barely fit in and barely turn around and curl up and lay down. And dogs are the same way. If you saw, if you saw sometimes how many dogs I could pack in a box, <laughs> you know, on a hunting trip <laughs> and see two or three noses looking at the bars, everyone would be like, oh, my God, they're jam-. No, they can all get in there, turn around, and they, they snuggle up. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, the, the weather really isn't an issue. Um, it's more of an issue if you're going to be more of a cold weather hunter. Um, you know, you might want a dog with a little more a little more coat to it, maybe in the flushing breeds or some of the the rough coated breeds in the pointing world that have like a dual coat. They have an outer and an undercoat. Um, they're going to be just a more comfortable dog in the winter. But believe me, I got friends that that have German short hairs and Weinreiners, and they they live all over Wisconsin and Michigan and the Upper Midwest, and and they do fine. You know, okay. you just don't want to. You know, you're not going to duck hunt with them probably. That's yeah. in the cold weather. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Oh. Let's talk a little bit about crates, though, too. So, what is the? So, I mean, when we were growing up, well, and we never like I personally never had hunting dogs growing up. So the whole crate training thing to me seems like it's a relatively new tactic, which could be, I could be completely wrong, could have been around for years and years and years, whatever. But to me, it just seems like it's relatively new because I never went over to anybody's house and they were like, oh, we got to put the dog in the crate at night. You know, where, what is the concept behind crate training? I, I think it's so you don't have to clean up any poop or pee in the morning, to be honest with you. For real? <laughs> well, no. I mean, no, trust me, that is a part of it, though. It, it's, and you're right. I know when I was a kid, and, I, and I'm quite a bit older than you, I mean, you know, literally, believe this or not, um, my friend's dad would put his pointer, he would open the trunk of his Ford, and the dog would jump in, and he'd close the trunk. And that's yeah. where the dog rode on a, on a hunting trip, you know? Yeah, totally. And, and people with beagles, they'd put three or four of them in, in the trunk. You know, so crates kind of became a, a, a luxury thing. And then when they started making these molded or these wire crates for show people, um, it, it, it really just gives you peace of mind, especially when your puppy, when, you, when they say crate training the puppy, it's, it's really kind of just, it's, it's kind of like putting a, a baby in a crib. You talk to anybody who's raised kids, and if they didn't use a crib or a playpen, and I'll guarantee you, the kid doesn't understand confinement and probably can't stand anybody telling them what to do today. Um, dogs need to learn that, you know, that's not their time and it's time to be, it's time to settle down. And the crate also represents that. It's like, Oh, this is when we don't play. We don't play now. Um, you know, and it's hard to resonate with a puppy because if the puppy's not ready to quit, he's going to sit in that kennel or that crate in the house and he is going to cry and whine. And that's where you got to go back to just like raising kids you have to put that box somewhere where he can't see you, maybe by the back door or spare room or the basement, and, and ignore that, that cre- screaming and crying. And eventually, it, that crate is, is nothing more than just a place for that dog to lay down, a, a given place for that dog to lay down. And then he becomes a better traveling dog, too. He kind of understands, like, I, you know, oh, I, I get it. This is where I don't get to jump around, play catch, play fetch. I don't get to, you know beg for food while we're driving, I'm in a crate, you know. So there's just multi, multi purposes for them. But you're right, nowadays, even somebody who doesn't know, you know, as my friend, I have a really good friend over in Wisconsin by the name of Al Harmeyer, has a, a, a kennel over in Cedar Grove, north of Milwaukee. And he says, even for people who don't know shit from pudding, <laughs> they know about crate training nowadays. So you're right. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, everybody knows that term, crate training, whether you know shit from pudding about dogs. <laughs> they, know, they know the term crate training. That's a good question, really, because but it, it's new, but it's not new. You know, like all the old timers back in the day knew to put their dogs in kennels. They built boxes for them. They used the command. I use the word kennel when I want to go in a crate. I use the word kennel to get in in anything, in a door, in a kennel. In, a, in another room, I just open the door and say kennel, and the dog just knows that means to go where I'm kind of pointing. But, um, but no, I think it's very important. And, and you rarely will see people breaking those rules. Um, there, there's a few people whose dogs are truly their children, and they're just mortified at the fact that, you know, the dog would sleep in a crate. Um, you know, when they're old enough, I, I go to Red Roof Inns all over the country. I travel with my dogs everywhere. I mean, literally everywhere. And so I always hit red roof ends because they're, they, they never have a dog. Po- I mean, the dog policy is no problem. And when I go into red roof in, I've got three, four dogs sleeping in a king size bed with me. So, I mean, I love having a dog sleep in bed with me, but there's a lot of times when I don't, when they're young, when it's a new dog on the road, I don't want to wake up and step in something, you know? So that crate just has multitude of purposes. 
but it, 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 to me, it does teach the dog some control of temperament. He just doesn't always get his way. So that's the, the most important thing. Okay, that's interesting. What other kind of training techniques do you use? Like, is it different training, say, a dog to be a pet than it is a dog to be a hunting dog, especially, like, say, in the first six months? I'm assuming you're going to work with it a lot more, number one. But it's going to, I mean, obviously, it's going to be more than just sit, roll over, and play dead. Well, it's, it's pretty close. We don't do the roll over and play dead much, you know, but, but you know, come sit and stay is what anybody that has a gun dog in the first six months is going to work on some of that. Just basic house dog obedience. Come when I call you, stay when I tell you to, and sit, you know, and you also hear people say, well, do you teach a pointing dog to sit? And that, yes, because it's a command. It's not an instinct for the dog. You know, the dog sits right. when he feels like it. And when you want him to sit, you got to tell him to sit. So, yeah, come sit. And then eventually heal. You know, like, how many people have you seen going down the street and the dog, even a little dog, is just pulling their arms out of their socket, you know? And it drives me crazy. It's just like, come on. Yank, you know, well, I, don't, I shouldn't just say yank that dog back ass over tea kettle. But basically, teach that dog to walk on a leash. It's not that hard to do. So, yeah, for gun dogs and house dogs, I think that first six months of training, basically the same thing. You want them to be good, good canine citizens. Um, you don't want them to embarrass the hell out of you. You don't want them jumping up on everything. Like a lot of dogs you'll see jump on people. And people will see my dog, and I let them, I don't let them jump on me, but I let them stand up on their back legs and put their paws on me. And most people can't stand that because, you know, you're getting dog hair or anything on your clothes. But I won't let them jump on me. Like, I won't let them jump at their will to just walk up to me and go, bam, with their front feet. I won't let them do that. But when they come to me and I can tell they want to, I'll tap my chest and, boom, they put their paws up here and give them a big snuggie and, you know, just like a house dog. Yep. So the gun, the, the gun dog stuff doesn't have to start too early. Um, yeah, believe me, people do it. You know, people get them on birds real early. They, they sometimes get them to a trainer, and a, and, a, and a good trainer will say, well, here, here, I'll give you some things to do at home, but he's a little young yet to, to do any intensive, you know, bird work or, or obedience work for, for hunting. So, no, up to six months, I'd say same thing. I, and I don't do anything different with my dogs than we've done with my, uh, our, my wife's house dogs. Same thing. It's very, very simple. So at what age... So say I buy a puppy, and mm-hmm. I've decided I want to, whatever kind of training, um, whatever kind of hunting dog it is, at what age should I start looking for a trainer? So but wait, let's talk a little bit about hiring a, a professional trainer compared to doing it on your own. What would be the pros and cons to each? Um, well, the, the pro to hiring a trainer, I would say, would come more with the with the hunt if you're going to have if you know you want to do some hunting with that dog and you've either a on you're on your first dog and you you know you can look at all the youtube videos and you can read all the books and and it's like hang on we got a little dog yeah, will you guys be quiet <laughs> mother, mother already got a bone and she's telling the other dog to stay away um <laughs> so the the pros for a trainer would be yeah if you're going to do something above just have a pet dog and a, a trainer will come in very handy because a good trainer will have you come to the the facility he'll he'll start teaching the dog some some good obedience and and then he'll transfer that obedience to you he'll teach you how to teach the dog so that because if you if you get a trainer that just takes your dog um and you say i want you to do this with my dog and i'll pick it up next month it's probably not going to do the same work for you as it did for that trainer. It's just the dog won't have the respect or the rapport built with you. So the, the pros to having a trainer are, are big if you're going to get into the sporting world or possibly the competition world with dogs, like retriever competitions and things like that. But um, the, the cons to it are if you think you can just drop it off and, and it's going to be like magic, you're going to pick the dog up and it's going to be special, that the con would really be what's in your head. You're, yeah. you're conning your, you're conning yourself into a quick, easy path, you know. 
And, and then with um, the pros and cons of doing it yourself would definitely be if you do it right, and, I, and really if you, the best thing people can do is to join a, a sporting dog club, and there's, there's a gazillion of them all over the country, literally. A lot of times they might be breed specific, but a lot of the clubs would just be a bird dog club. And if it's a good organization, they're going to welcome you in even if you don't have their breed of dog or even that style of dog. Because if somebody shows you some stuff hands-on, it's, like, it's just way better than you reading a book or looking at YouTube and trying to apply it. So, you know, I... I I try. I tried training my first dog by my. Well, me and my buddy tried training our first two dogs by ourselves, and and they really sucked to be honest with you, Carrie, because we we didn't know what we were, we didn't know what we were doing. But but we we got involved. The the group that I um, I'm a judge for is called NAVD. It's North American Versatile Hunting Dog Association, and so it's a testing and training organization. There's like 70 chapters around the country. In fact, Wisconsin's got five five chapters itself. And I don't know if that's because there's more hunters there or if they all can't get along in Wisconsin. I don't know how it, why, but there's five chapters in Wisconsin. And that's a group that typically is, it, it concentrates on the pointing breeds, but I've, I've, I've never ran into a chapter that wouldn't welcome you with a Labrador or a Springer Spaniel or a, um, a, a, you know, a dog, you know, any of the flushing breeds, a Chesapeake. Um, they'll, because all the dogs need the same kind of work, you know, exposure to birds, exposure to steadiness and things like that. So I would tell everybody, don't try it by yourself. Go, don't go solo. Try to find a club. Try to find a, a group. If you can't do that, then, yeah, go to a trainer, but make sure that trainer, and you make sure you're able to visit that trainer a lot. Ooh, sounds like a puppy just stepped on something. <laughs> I don't know if you heard that. Um, and, uh, you know, if you can find a trainer that will work with you, that would be, your, to me, your second best bet. But I, I really like joining a, a club or group. Plus, then you're going to meet some people. You're going to meet some – there's always some newbies, so you kind of gravitate toward each other because you're all a bunch of dummies. And then there's always going to be a couple people there with some experience that will, you know, that will help you. And uh, the other biggest thing is, you know, all the pros and cons and everything else, there's two things I tell everybody you got to develop some thick skin because your dog's going to embarrass you and you got to admit when things are going wrong. And, and you cannot wear rose-colored glasses when you're messing with the dog world. And that is so hard for people to do. The minute they get their dog, that's the best breed. Or, oh, this dog's, yeah, parents, yeah, were, this dog's parents did this, this, and this. I said, yeah, well, your dog's not doing that. So, you know. <laughs> So why don't you take your sunglasses off and see what the rest of the world looks like. Your dog sucks right now, and let's make it better. You know? <laughs> That's the two biggest pieces of advice. I know I'd like to be deeper, but, yeah, the two oldest things in the world, develop a thick skin, and, you know, that works in work and everything else, in school and everything, you know. Interesting. Yeah. It's easy. It's simple. It's frustrating. <laughs> it's so simple. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's a little daunting, though, and, you know, believe me, and I get emails every day, people asking me, and when I started the podcast two years ago, I did it kind of a, like, oh, you know, I like to have kind of like a diary of, you know, friends I hunt with, some, a few famous people, if I can ever get them on, and, and that all came together, and then, of course, now, like, you've been podcasting for how many years now? Five. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, you got, you, you're way double over me. And, you know, people start asking you questions and it becomes, it's starting to become like a little bit of work, but yeah. it is amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that the, the people who don't know anything are at least writing me. And I, the only thing I want to say is, well, did you look at the backlog of episodes? All those questions are answered, but they, <laughs> but they, they still want they still want to write me an email. And I won't say I answer every email, yeah. but darn near every one of my answer, if I can, you know, yeah. and try to help them. Because it is, it's daunting, you know, you get this dog and then you read some, you read articles and say, you know, make sure you don't get your dog gun shy and make sure you don't get the dog, the dog, don't let the dog chase deer and don't let the, and all of a sudden like, you feel like, you feel like it's exam time in high school. You're just like, oh no, I didn't study. I didn't study. And, uh, but you can, you can, anybody can do it. Honestly, if I could get to this point, 
anybody could do it, Carrie. Anybody. Well, that that does kind of raise another just a small question. Like they always say, you can't eat, teach an old dog new tricks. So what if I buy a puppy? Not really the right breed for me, but I don't obviously want to give it give it up. I'm trying to train it, and it's like been a year and a half, and I'm like, it's just not working. Can you go to a trainer and be like, look, I have really screwed up this dog. Can you help me fix it? You can, um, but what you just got to go to the right trainer. And honestly, um, it sounds kind of funny. If a trainer will just say yes, you probably didn't do enough research on the trainer. Okay. Because there's un- unfortunately, and God, I hope this doesn't knock down my uh, my downloads and, and listenership. But um, <laughs> there's a lot of trainers out there, a lot of them. But a lot of them are. You know, they're like they're they have a full time job during the day and they cram all this in at night and on the weekends. And and believe me, they they can do a good job, but you know, they're trying to make a name for themselves and they will take a project on that maybe not should have been taken on. So if you did have that dog and you, you said, Here, I didn't do nothing, I think I screwed it up, a good trainer will say, Okay, let me evaluate it or let's get together on Saturday and evaluate it. And he won't chart. He won't say, all right, let me keep the dog from, he, he could, if he saw some potential, but I know some really good trainers. They're going to be honest with you real quick. They could literally call you up three or four days and go, look, I, I've, I've tried some stuff like normal stuff. And uh, I, I could try a lot more, but I don't see the potential here. Right. I, or I don't see this fixable. And a good trainer will tell you that, you know. Um, yeah. But also, a good trainer is invaluable, too. Um, I, I've, I have one here in Michigan that I rely on a lot because, you know, he's younger than I am, but he's, he's been in dog since he was in, you know, in high school and well-known, well-known bird dog trainer. And he's just got that approach where, like, he's not looking for the next client. He just wants to solve a problem. And if he doesn't think he can solve a problem – He'll tell you, and and it's hard to it's kind of hard to swallow because then it's like bringing your kid to another school and the principal says I don't think your kid's good enough to be at this school. You're like, oh shit, <laughs> I I didn't realize he was a dumbass, you know. <laughs> so, um, I no, you know, good, yeah. that, that's about all I could tell you in that department. But yeah, and then there's also dogs that didn't get early exposure, but it, it didn't really you know you could have skipped a few years. If the genetics are there, you should be able to do something with that dog as far as in the, in the bird dog world. But anybody, anybody that has hunting dogs, usually they're starting to do some of the game work, whether it's birds or hounds on, you know, raccoons or, or uh, you know, any, any of the hound work or even bears. Those young dogs are going to get some work early in their first year because they want to see if there's something – they certainly would never wait on purpose, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. So, but if you had a good genetic dog, and, you know, that the parents hunted and you didn't do nothing with it, there's a good chance that, yeah, there's no reason it wouldn't learn. Uh, I don't believe that old dogs can't learn new tricks. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, getting them, getting them to learn it and, and sure. finding out. That's what's good about certain trainers. You know, it used to be, they all had like, it was all like obedience training, real forceful, and you basically made the dog submit. And nowadays, it's a lot of positive reinforcement, and they literally, they're almost kind of fooling the dog into doing a good job. And the dog's like, oh, no, you know what? That wasn't so hard. Okay, I'll do that again for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, 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 it's not rocket science, but it's, it's kind of like, it's like learning a new language, though. It is like learning a new language. It is, especially for someone who's considering getting into all this stuff and really just has had no exposure to it. I don't know anybody. I mean, I have, like, online friends who have dogs. Um, right, but right. I don't know anybody personally who has a hunting dog. So so for me, someone like me who I love to pheasant hunt now, anytime I go to, like, one of them game farms, I always have to hire somebody with a dog because I don't have one. Right, so right. So all this is really quite fascinating, but it is it's a little on the overwhelming side, but I have listened to many, many, many of your episodes and that's been very helpful too. Yeah. And a, a person could get by with, you know, l- listening to some of those episodes if they could really, if they, 
that was a close call. <laughs> hey, hang on, listeners. It's time to throw biscuits on the floor. I'm showing everybody what a good trainer I am. There. Everybody gets a biscuit. <laughs> pitiful. Pitiful. I had one of the probably world-renowned, certainly North American-renowned trainers, George Hickox, on about a month ago. And, and I had to do that while the dogs were, because I do this all out in my recording studios in my kennel building. And, and, and I told him, he says, yeah, you train them dogs pretty good, Ron. I'm like, yeah, I sure did. I can get him to quit doing anything if I throw biscuits at him. Right. Dogs are man's best friend. <laughs> exactly. But you know, if, if you ever wanted to do that, literally, um, I haven't been t- too involved with other bird dog clubs but I know there's a there's a bunch of them out there. Yeah. Um, and you you'll get you, it'll be such a jump start for anybody to get involved. I mean, obviously I push NAVDA. Uh, if you've got a pointing dog, I, I push that. The chapters will almost always have somebody like a Walmart greeter that's you know kind of says, hey, I, I noticed you're standing there for two two training sessions not doing anything. You know, yeah, because not everybody's super outgoing, or or you don't want to ask a dumb question. Um, yeah. But most most chapters, and I will, you know, in NAVDA, and I and I'm sure, just that my experience has always been with them. Uh, most bird dog clubs, whether if you got a retriever, you get involved with a retrieving club. There's always someone's going to help you, and way better than DVDs and videos and YouTube or even listen to my podcast is get somebody hands on and watch them do something with the dog. And it, it it's it's like. Uh, It'd be like the Evelyn Wood speed reading course compared to learning, you know, reading the other way. Gotcha. So tell, tell, let's talk about your, your podcast and how you got into dogs and dog breeding. breeding. Because your Facebook page, let me pull it back up here, is, well, people can find it by searching the Hunting Dog Podcast. Yeah. Well, what happened was, like I said, I got that first German short hair for $40, and, and it sucked. and it it ran away twice. And the third time, we, we don't really know if it was hit by a car or not. But Aww. a friend, a, well, you never know. I mean, yeah, they're, literally, know, I know. <laughs> they're literally our runaway dogs, too. And we've got to take a whole other podcast episode. But there are some dogs, and you'll know, if, you'll know it when you have one. They are just bound and determined to piss you off and run away, <laughs> okay? Um, you know, usually they're not running away far, but the ones that don't want to come back, yeah, it's probably a good reason for that. But so once I had that, what I call that crappy dog, a um, friend of mine had a good German short hair that we hunted over, hunted grouse and woodcock over, and, and I said, I, I, I've got to find one. So I went to a, a reputable kennel out in, it happened to be in Rockford, Michigan. It's, it's no longer there, but, you know, this is almost 30 years ago. And I, I spent more money than I should have or more money than I told my wife I was going to spend. And, and I picked up a puppy and started kind of, you know, she was never a super well-trained obedience dog, but she was a good hunting dog. We did enough of the right stuff with her. Um, and then what happens with everybody, they're like, you know what? We should have puppies. We should breed your dog and my dog. And anybody who doesn't start out as a backyard breeder, um, then you obviously were raised in a family who was already breeding dogs and you already got some, you know, background because most everybody starts out in their backyard with their first litter, your buddy's dog and your dog, and let's try to sell these puppies. So I I never did a lot of that, but it was, I've just been a dog nut, you know, ever since I was born, you know, we had dogs. There was a picture of me with a hunting dog and I was like two years old. Um, and there's a grin on my face. So obviously there was some connection there. And so once I had that dog and, and, and whelped a litter of puppies and actually found homes for them, then you get the mistake of going, I could do that again. <laughs> I could do that again, you know? And then like one day I was just a dog man and the next day I was a breeder. But, um, so I just, I really kind of just jumped in with both feet, but immediately by my second litter, I literally, again, through chapter help and friends help and people who have done it before me, I did what they did. I just literally, I didn't try to reinvent the wheel. I did exactly what they did. Um, I, I built a certain kind of kennel. I built a certain kind of whelping box. I, I didn't try to do it on a shoestring. I spent a lot of money on it. 
um, tried to find good homes for the dogs. But then, um, you know, eventually, you know, we, we, we have, my wife and I have three daughters back. Well, we still have three daughters, but they were, of course, they were all little. And that was one of the other things, <laughs> you know, you got three little kids. Wouldn't they love this? You don't think of the, wouldn't they love to see a litter of puppies born? Oh, yeah, what a great lesson for them. <laughs> well, you know, don't do it for that reason, trust me. Because <laughs> you know, they're, when you're little, they're not going to help you clean up. <laughs> it's still going to be a lot of work. Right. A lot of people do. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah. I mean, how many people go like, yeah, we're gonna, we'd love to have a litter of dogs. Oh, the kids would learn so much from it. No, the kids would learn how to hold puppies. That's all they would learn. <laughs> right. you, and not you, only do you have to clean up after the puppies now and yeah. the kids. Yeah, and then you've got to change the kids' clothes and throw them. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> So, I mean, I got started basically just about like everybody else, unless you came from a family. Um, you know, there's, I know there's, there's family names in the dog world that uh, they go all the way back to the early 1900s that their great-grandfather was breeding dogs. So th- those people grew up, they had not just the resources, they had the background the knowledge. But yeah, I just grew up like a, a typical guy, but just always kind of, you know, looking at somebody else's place, you go visit somebody and like, oh, wow, they got nicer kennel boxes. Oh, you know what? I got to buy them. I got I to gotta have, I got to have better boxes. And, you know, I made my first kennel out of panels. And, and I said, no, you know what? I went to a kennel. I got to, I got to get real kennel panels, like a real kennel. So, you know, I started out on a shoestring and started out just copying everybody. Um, and uh, it, it just kind of turned into as, as far as the dancing Duke goes, um, all three of my daughters were in dance class. Um, one of them was good, <laughs> but mother, mother, ma- mother made them take dance classes for many, many years. Okay. So, uh, when they were in a dance class and they were, and I was watching them, if, if, and when I was watching them, when I'm in town and, and not working, we always watched old John Wayne movies. So, and True Grit was their famous because of, you know, little Maddie Ross, the, the heroine of the movie, and being a girl about, you know, a little older than them at the time. So it was just a natural thing. Uh, I came up with Dancing Duke Kennels because of the girls dancing and my love of John Wayne. So that's, that's, that's the history of the name. Yeah, that's the history of the name. Yeah. Why did you start the podcast? <laughs> oh, you know, that, that was something I started listening to uh, some podcasts about four years ago. In fact, um, well, you, you, you and I talked once before, obviously, before we yep. you know, hit the record button a couple weeks ago. And I got, I, I do, a, once a year I do a show with Steve Vanella on the Meat Eater with my dog, usually with my dogs. Three of the episodes have been with my dogs. And um, so he started a podcast because Joe Rogan talked him into doing a podcast. Literally said, you've got to do a podcast. So I recorded one of his first ones with him in Texas on a hunt. And the minute we hung up the headphones, all I could think of was like, I want to have conversations like this with dog people. Because just like, you know, like you, you like turkey hunt a lot. I hear you, you know, when you're talking on your podcast and you, and yeah. you, uh, you yeah. do some deer hunting. Although I heard your last one, you didn't get near the hunting in this year that you wanted to, but that's not a story. <laughs> but that happens to everybody. But I'm a real social hunter. You know, I don't do a lot of solo hunting. I mean, I will have an hour or two by my house, go out and take the dogs out, take a couple of young dogs out, but I'm real social. And I just, the minute we did that first podcast with Steve, it was like a round, it was like having a poker game, but you're all talking about the same subject, not really paying attention to the poker game. And you just like had one of those great conversations. You know, there's always a, a drink flowing and everybody telling a story and I'm like, wow, that's how – I said, I got to start – I want to record these things. And literally, I got a little, a little uh, I guess, nostalgic. Um, my, my folks have been gone for quite a few years. And I thought, how cool it would be to have – you know, I've got pictures of my family, my mom and dad. But it's almost like you can't remember their voice anymore, you know? Yep. And, and who wants to set up an old 8-millimeter thing in a projector to watch – movies for me in the 60s when my dad was walking by a grill, you know, and the baseball hit him or something. So I would have loved to had conversations of my dad and his friends when they were golfing or sitting at the VFW hall after World War II, you know. I mean, yep. and like hearing those guys and always with their, you know, their, their pants down a little bit. Once, once a beer or a drink goes into somebody, 
you really get the stories going, you know? And, and I said, I would just love to have conversations like that of my mom and dad and their family. We had a big family and I, and they, they don't exist. And so one of my catalysts was that someday I don't know which kids are going to get all my guns because I, I have way too many shotguns. I don't know which grandkids hopefully will have them. I don't have grandkids yet, but we're praying. Um, but anyway, um, like they will always be able to go, unless something changes in this world, they're always going to be able to go back. They're going to be able to hear their grandpa or their great grandpa talk about dogs and his hunting trips with his friends. Um, because I just had that, I'm a real family person and, and a real social hunter. You know, you're not going to catch me going on a backcountry uh, bird hunt and camping out for three days and hiking up. You know? No, yeah. I'm going to drive somewhere. I'm going to yeah. hunt for five or six hours, and we're going to go sit there and talk. We're going to talk ourselves into the next day's hunt. You know, so that that's kind of why I started the podcast, and I'm, now I'm just having a ball with it. It's it's grow, it, it's growing to a point where I, I really never thought it would grow, but. Um, I guess everything, you know, like everything takes time, you know, until it, it, the word gets out. So yeah. but that's how that got started. And, and between the kennel and the podcast, I, I'd like to retire from work so I could just do all that full time. Yeah. That is quite possibly the coolest reason to start a podcast I have ever heard. Honestly, that is very cool. I, I kind of thought everybody thought that way. No, <laughs> I just, you, you yeah. probably talked to a lot of podcasters. Maybe that's not it, huh? No, well, I started my podcast just because I wanted to learn how to be a better hunter and a better fisherman, and I was blogging, and everybody and their brother has a blog, so getting somebody to take five minutes to answer some questions for you was hard, but the minute I mentioned podcast, online talk show, all of a sudden it was, well, uh, sure, I can give you an hour of my time. Yeah, I know. Well, that's, that's a good reason, though. Yeah, yeah I, I just I, wanted to be a better hunter, and I wanted people to talk to me about it. She's like saying, I got to suck at this. I got to figure out a way. To, I got to figure out a way to get people's attention and have them listen and answer my questions. Seriously? Yeah. Exactly. Oh, God, if I, if I had to write people, if I had to type a question to somebody, I'd never have any questions answered. I'm a talker. <laughs> now, obviously, you can tell I'm a little bit of a talker. That's good, though. That's good. It, but it's, well, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Um, you know, I, I've never, uh, you know, it's, only, it's only been just a little over two years. I put out about four episodes a month. A couple times I'll put in a fifth episode. Um, and, and there might be times when, you know, I skip, you know, but I, I've yet to skip yet. And my thing is like, and I don't know if it, because I know you, you, like, again, you're more of a turkey big game hunter, but you've, like you said, you've, yeah. you know, been to, you've shot some pheasants and stuff. You've been to some preserves. and the uh in the dog world there's just always just i didn't realize i thought i was going to run out of people to talk to and i don't know if it's that way for you with with big game and turkeys because there's just so many nuances with with dogs that it's like wow it seems like yeah. i got a a never ending um list of 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 things to talk about you know of course we we oh, get yeah. off subject once in a while with conservation or or public land access, we talk a little bit about that, but very rarely, you know. I'm not I'm not smart enough to talk about all those things. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can, no, I can totally understand that because there's so many different breeds and so many different hunting tactics and hunting styles and training tactics where really bow hunting for deer is pretty straightforward. <laughs> yeah, you've got to be quiet. You can't talk. You've got to sit in a tree, you know, and... There's and try to not to what? Try not to fart? I don't. I don't get it. I don't get it. I, in fact, you know what? Now that we're on that subject, Carrie, I, I've been wanting to ask somebody: What is the attraction to sitting in a tree? So you know, I'm a turkey hunter more than a deer hunter, right? There's a reason okay. for that because I like running you and don't... gunning, and sitting in a tree stands. Oh my God! You see, my tweets go up exponentially when I'm sitting in the tree stand because I'm freaking bored. <laughs> so so you, when you're in a tree, you're what? You're on Facebook and tweeting? <laughs> Pretty much. Oh, nice. They're like, nice. Well, wow, Carrie tweeted 841 times today. She must be hunting. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder why you don't get a lot of animals. <laughs> I know. No, no, all joking aside, 
um, that is one of the reasons why turkey hunting appeals to me more than deer hunting. I do like deer hunting, of course, but turkey hunting, they're just so, so much like bird hunting. You're constantly doing stuff here. The animals are more engaged with you. So we're like, you know, with bird hunting, you have a dog, you have something to engage you and keep moving and keep going and yeah. keep, your, keep your attention. Yeah, yeah. I, I I know I I've turkey hunted just a tiny bit. I mean, really, like probably a total of about four or five mornings. Um, I, I've yet to get one, but um, I did like it, and it wasn't like an all day thing either. You know, right? Those people go up in them trees and they bring their lunch. You know, and I know uh, my daughter's uh, has a boyfriend who films hunts for. Uh, Oh, what's the name of the, um, you know, the Kiefer brothers have that show dropped project Alaska. Sure. Yeah. Those guys, he films for them part time and oh. he has to, he has to pee in a bottle when he's up in a tree. I know. No, that's, yeah. I'm not, any, anything that makes you do that. I'm not doing that. I'm not, I'm not going there. No, I know I do. I have a hard time with it. I have a hard time sitting still. It is probably why I never get any deer because I'll sit for a couple hours and I'll be like, Oh, well, maybe I should go see what's over the next ridge. Maybe exactly. there's something over there to see. And I, I you think know, maybe I you, freaking... <laughs> I think maybe you need a, I'll, I'll talk to my friend, Tracy, you might, you need a turkey dog. <laughs> right. Oh my God. No, no joke. I would love to go fall hunt, turkey hunting with a dog. I mean, my God. Oh, Cute. Tracy! Tracy is the guy. He he uh, he's in the outdoor. He's real heavy duty in the outdoor. He makes his living in the outdoor, like in media and brokering things and stuff like that. He's been at it forever. And I I couldn't go out with him this year, but he got a couple new dogs, and it is the you can't do it in the spring. Obviously, it's in the fall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what a cool way to go hunt turkeys! Oh my God. He, how fun would that be? Would have you seven, have you heard how it works and everything? Have you read up on it? Yep. Yep. Oh, um yeah. Yeah, I had, I did an interview a couple of years ago with um with Steve Hickman and he he has a dog that he takes out and he sits in the blind, he sends her out and then she goes and scatters them. It 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 sounds like so yeah. much fun. Yeah, oh absolutely. And if you had a shitty bird dog that just didn't listen to you, you might be able to turkey hunt with it in the fall. <laughs> right. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> you should, you should pass along his information. I would love to interview him. Yeah. Oh yeah. He, he, uh, yeah, I'll save all the, all the different things he does, but I mean, we, we did a, we, we did a podcast together and, and, uh, the, the funny thing is it's, you, you think about a small niche, that is a small yeah. group of people in this country. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that is t- a tiny group of people in this country. Um, no. You know, I think I'm up against it sometimes in the in the bird dog world. But my God, there's a gazillion people that would like at least like own. Oh yeah, I've been to a preserve. Oh yeah, I know a guy who had one. You say turkey dog, and people look at you like the RCA dog, huh? What? I know, totally. Turkey dog. Like, what? But you you might be ready for a bird dog if you don't like to sit in a tree and you like to act a little, you know, like to move around a little bit. Yeah, I think yeah. a bird dog might be in your future. I know, and I love pheasant hunting. I just I don't have a dog, so like I said, it's I'm pretty limited. So yeah. maybe we'll, we'll buy are. this new house. We'll see. Never. Oh, so are you in an apartment then right now? We live in a condo. Condo? So. Yeah. So it's not really yeah. conducive yeah. for dogs. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. We're coming up on our 10 year anniversary May 1st. We were like, all right, 10 years here, and then <laughs> we we got to go. We got to buy a bigger house with a yard. There you go. So. Yeah, well, when you're ready for that, you tell me. I'll, I'll help you find a dog. I mean, you yeah. know, literally, I, I, there's, it, I'll tell you, Wisconsin, and between Wisconsin and Minnesota, you would have so many choices if you took your time. <laughs> Seriously. I, it, in fact, it would be the, a problem because you'd be like, honey, well, let's, go look at, let's go look at small Munsterlanders today. And then yeah. he'll look at an article. Well, you know what? I want to go look at some wire-haired pointing Griffons. And you'll, you'll drive yourself crazy. But I'm telling you, Wisconsin and Minnesota, there is a gob of, of good dog breeders up there. So you're in a good place for it. That's for sure. Good deal. You are definitely. But, yeah, we got to get you, uh, you know, you'll, you'll, throw that, you'll throw that tree stand away after you have a dog. Trust me. <laughs> I know. Well, probably because I'll probably get into fall bird hunting more. I love, I love chasing birds. I love 
love, love turkey hunting. I, lo- I do enjoy deer hunting. I do. But I love chasing them. I'll chase them. I'll chase them all over the field, left and right. <laughs> chase them under trees. Oh, I, oh my God. Am, am I wrong, or aren't you, supposed, aren't you supposed to sit still and be quiet to shoot a turkey? Nah. Nah. No. Have you, you get not frustrated. To my Hail Mary turkey hunt episode? Yeah, I guess I did that. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so you're, you're trying to do the end around pass and head it off at the pass? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> that was the funnest freaking hunt I've ever been on. <laughs> well, I, I got a. I, I, I did shoot one turkey. I got, I'll tell you, I'll try to make this a quick story, but <laughs> okay. I was, my high school, my high school trip, you know, like a lot of people go down to Florida for high school senior class trip. Yeah. Um, yeah. Me and my friends went down to Tennessee and we went boar hunting. That was our senior class trip. <laughs> yeah, I was for being born and raised in Chicago. I did not fit the mold. I, I fit the mold with the taverns. Believe me, I actually drove a beer truck for two years. Um, so, which is probably why I have a liver the size of Kansas. But um, <laughs> we we went we went to Tennessee. We did some research and we went boar hunting for our senior class trip. Me and three guys and we're down there and it was you know it was turkey season in Tennessee. And so this this outfit and we and we saved our money for anything you know we were all working I was a bus boy and you know that kind of stuff but we saved our money it wasn't a whole lot of money we all shared the gas and got down there and uh, so the lodge said Does, do any of you want to go turkey hunting and already having pheasant hunting and stuff a little bit and rabbit hunted I'm like I'd love to and he says well it's fifty dollars for a tag and I'm like okay you know I think I probably borrowed ten from each and I had 20 in my pocket but I, I had to do it so this guy's name was buttons and he takes me way out in the mountains with the Jeep and we parked the Jeep and we walk you know it's we're walking out at dark and you get behind this big rock pile and he's got one of them box calls you know it's like duck, 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 all that stuff and and I'm, as I'm this is kind of cool you know and uh, he, he kind of nods his head and he nudges me and he, he's kind of telling me to look forward and I'm I'm looking and I don't see nothing, and he's kind of nudging me like a little quicker with his elbow, like, "Come on, you dumb city slicker! There's a turkey walking towards you, you know." And Carrie, I don't see this thing. I don't know what I was looking at. I don't know even though, honestly, I'd never seen a wild turkey in my life. I mean, I I knew what they looked like in pictures, but I never saw one, you know. And you know how they kind of just, I don't know how, but they kind of move without making any noise for sure. Yeah. And I mean, unless you're sitting there quiet and something was coming through leaves or something but it was rocky area and it was oak trees and finally i see this bird and he's he's walking right toward the guy calling and we're behind rocks so we're we're pretty golden and this turkey's getting closer and closer and closer it's probably only 15 to 10 yards away and now i'm kind of just staring at its big head and you know you know it's no, he wasn't fanning out, but he, he was looking all, you know, all turkey-ish, you know. And so he's like, he's kind of trying to tell me to shoot. So I stand up, and I made a big noise, like, like, yeah, like that. Yeah. And this guy, this guy's in his buttons. He goes, what the? And because I'm trying to make the, I thought they were supposed to, I thought you're supposed to shoot him on the wing. I did oh. not know. <laughs> I did not know you shot a turkey. <laughs> this is the, the God's truth on my mother's grave. I had no freaking clue that you would shoot a bird on the ground. I never shot a pheasant on the ground. Why would I shoot a turkey on the ground? And this is, and this is, this, and this is no bullshit. That turkey ran about five steps and took off, and I dropped it. With my Remington 1100, I dropped it. And oh the guy, he was like, I've never seen nothing like that in my whole goddamn life. He told that story for two more days to anybody who would listen to it. This boy from oh Chicago God. comes down here, stands up and says, yeah, and makes that turkey fly. <laughs> I had oh no God, idea. That's you were, so funny. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, yeah. I was, so next time I'm going to actually let it get close and shoot it in the head. You know, I mean, I guess, you know, that's oh, probably that's the funny. proper way to do it. Instead of pepper and full of uh, full of number two shot like I did, but no, I, I dropped that thing on the wing, so I'm 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 an all right wing shooter. <laughs> that is hysterical. Oh my god. So don't invite me on your first fall turkey hunt because I want to shoot them on the wing. <laughs> oh my gosh. 
<laughs> that is too funny. <laughs> well, that's just it. That's me. But um, no, I mean, I've just uh, I, I I never can understand. I, I, I love all, I mean, I'm, I'm in favor of all hunt, hunting. I'm in favor of high fence hunting. I, I don't really care as long as we're all on the same page and no one's calling each other names, you know, whatever you, yeah. whatever it takes to stay out there in the outdoor world a little bit. Um, but I can't imagine, I, I've been accused of loving or that people who hunt with dogs love dogs more than they love hunting. And I'll be honest with you, it's, it's probably 50-50. It really is. It, and then if you had to throw in the equation, probably love people and dogs more than hunting. Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I still go to the store to buy a lot of meat because you can't feed yourself in a year with what you shoot over a dog. I mean, unless you're full time at it. Yeah. That's funny. Oh my gosh. So are you well, proficient on, enough with the are you proficient enough with a shotgun if I show up someday and take you that you could hit something or would it be a moot point? Oh yeah. Oh no. I, my little twenty gauge has killed more birds than any of my rifles. Well, that's encouraging. I like the sound of that. That's good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh my god. Could you imagine us hunting together? Oh my gosh. We would just laugh and have shenanigans left and right. Pretty yeah, hilarious. yeah, that's and th- and that's especially especially when you go to a preserve. It's not like you're, you're not risking, you know, you know, like when you're grouse hunting, you can chit chat a little bit, but you really got to pay attention. I mean, you got to be walking like a, you got to be walking arm, you know, at port arms, ready to shoulder that gun. But when you're at a preserve, it, it's so much more relaxed. Yeah, it would be trouble. <laughs> I think you're right. It'd be trouble, especially like, with yeah, Wisconsin. Just- yeah, I know, right? <laughs> too oh, funny. You guys drink too. Where they can? What's that? You guys drink too much in Wisconsin. <laughs> I know. You think you think you could keep up? <laughs> well, that was the. If you heard that, don't edit it. That was the third pop top I had since we've been talking. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> oh my gosh! See, even the dogs are like, "Yep, let's let's have some fun." <laughs> That's right. All right, Ram, well, tell the listeners where they can find out more about you, where they can find your podcast and social media channels. Well, we are, uh, like, like every podcast on, on Stitcher and iTunes, uh, Podbean, and I think just about every other, other thing, um, it, we are, we're starting a website. It should come out in February. It's obviously going to be called The Hunting Dog Podcast, and we're going to try to have uh, – uh, some you know some game some game cooking on there just some you know standard recipes that work for people we're going to try to have a a question and answer thing where people if they have a specific question that maybe one of the guests can answer or one of our past guests can answer um we're we're going to try to make it a, a a kind of a good interactive website not just a place to figure out how to listen to the podcast um, and then, of course, it'll have some sponsored links, and obviously, it'll have a lot of conservation links like DU, Pheasants Forever, Quail Forever, Rough Grouse Society, because, you know, like in anything, with the whitetails and, and the deer and the turkey, you've got the Turkey Federation, and, you know, I mean, all those, all those organizations are doing a lot of good stuff for all of us hunters out there. So, you know, we'll link up to things like that. But, yeah, if they just look up the Hunting Dog Podcast on, on anything, It'll come up. You'll see it on Stitcher and iTunes. I, Stitcher is more of an Android and iTunes, obviously, um, the iOS, uh, iPhone system. But um, just like you say, if you do listen, put a rate and a review on there because it makes us up there in the ratings. So, sure. Um, but yeah, and uh, yeah, when the podcast or when the website comes up, we're, uh, it'll be slow. I don't. Have you ever tried that, Carrie? Putting a, a, a do you have a website that accompanies? I haven't noticed it. If you do, or I haven't seen a link to it. Yeah, to, to I have. Your... A, yeah, I have. Um, I've actually a lot of times I'll promote the website link rather than the podcast link because people. I think the They're player already listening on my to the podcast. Yeah, 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 and my my player on my website is more friendly than like the Libsyn link. Right. 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 And that's just another way they can listen to it. But I mean, do you, do you put a lot of content into it for people, or do you do you find yourself is it overwhelming? Because I'm starting to get a little nervous about starting it. 
it, it, it can be overwhelming. And it's hard because, like, I do a ton of blogging as well as the podcast episodes. But just the post for the podcast episodes, I put all the show notes and all the links. And it is a lot of extra work. But yeah. I, I find that it's a greater return on investment because Google really likes blog posts and not so oh. much with podcasts. Oh. Well, in the next week or two, I'll have to talk to you off record, and you can give me some more tips on that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I totally will. All right. Well, thanks so much, right. Carrie. It's been a ball. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll try to do something next fall. I'll come over there with a couple of these long-eared, long-eared <laughs> brocos and, and see how good you are with that 20-gauge. Oh, that would be so fun. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Bye-bye. And that'll do it. Thanks so much for listening. Don't forget to find the show on iTunes. Just search for Huntfish Travel Podcast. Hit the subscribe button. You can also follow me on social media. Just go to huntfishtravel.net and click on the social media icon of your choice. The only one that's not listed there is Periscope. You can always find me on Periscope. Same Twitter handle, at Carrie Zilka. Until next time.